Our sermon this morning is going to be based in large part on all of the lessons that are being read this morning. Uh, primarily, it'll be based on our epistle lesson, uh, a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to young pastor Titus. We're going to read the first nine verses of Titus chapter one. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. And now, at his appointed season, he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our Savior, to Titus, my true son in our common faith. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined, he must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Do you know that you have authority. Say it, say it a little more strongly. Do you know that you have extraordinary authority and power? And what's more, do you know how to use it? As we read through scripture, it's very clear. God instills in God's people his power. But it's not often that we talk about that, that we talk about you, the individual Christian possessing power and authority, that we, the collective Christian church gathered here on earth, has authority. Now, perhaps we don't think about it. Perhaps we don't talk about it. Perhaps it's, it's just really coming to grips coming to terms with the realization that, that I, that you, that me and you together, we go about meaningful ministry and we do so with extraordinary authority. We're going to answer these two questions today. The first one, do you know you have power? Do you know you have authority. And the second, do you know how to use it? The first one, it, it's simple and straightforward. Do you know you have authority? Yes, you do. We've mentioned it already. You do have power and authority, but let's word it this way to remember it. You have it because God gives to you, to me, ordinary people, his extraordinary power. We saw it in the Old Testament. The, the prophet Amos was, was challenged that he could be speaking on God's behalf. And he said, hey, I'm just an ordinary guy. I, I, uh, I farm figs and I shepherd sheep, but God, but God called me to go and speak on his behalf. We saw it in the Old Testament. We saw it in the New Testament in Mark chapter six. God gathered together his apostles and he sent them out and he gave them his authority over the spiritual realm. 
And what the rest of the Gospels makes pretty clear, the history of Acts, these are pretty ordinary men. There's a story in Acts where John and Peter heal a man and they preach the gospel one day and the leaders at that time said, no, don't, don't do that. Don't speak. Just like Amaziah said to Amos, stop it. Who do you think you are? And this is how they responded. They said, look, salvation is found in no one else for there is no under name under heaven by which we must be saved. And what was people's reaction? Ordinary, unschooled guys. One thing's clear. God has authority. And these dudes have been hanging out with him. We see it with them, but it's also true for you. Jesus' last words on this earth to his disciples for all times and in all places were this. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So you go. You, you take it and go and use it to make disciples by baptizing them and teaching them all of what my word has to say. Just think about that for a second. If you had all authority, if you had unlimited power, unlimited resources, what would you do with it? The almighty God who by his power, created this world. Your almighty savior who orchestrated time to, to be born of a virgin, to willingly give up his life to death, only to pick it back up again. Oh, he has that. He has unlimited power. He has unlimited resources. And what did he do with it? He gave it to you. He said, here you go. You use it. I mean, can we just pause for a second and, and practice maybe as a group just standing at, in awe of this unique gospel truth that God gives to ordinary people his extraordinary power. I mean, just think about this. We, we're going to use the words from Titus that, that Paul greets Titus with the familiar greeting. He said, grace and peace to you from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. This is grace. Grace, you know, it is an unobligated giver, giving to undeserving. And in this case, very ordinary people, undeserved gifts, unconditionally. I mean, what makes us ordinary is that we're, we all share it's the same nature. We all share a common sinful nature. We don't deserve God's grace, his, his gifts of forgiveness and love, and, and yet he gives it. And on top of that, a cherry on top, he also gives us something that is not ours. We didn't deserve it. We couldn't even ask for it. But it came unasked, unforced, unearned. He said, here's my love. And oh, by the way, Here's my authority. Friends, he did this with one thing in mind. It's the hope of eternal life, which he promised to you. Now you see it come to light in Christ. But think about this, that the God who could orchestrate salvation and did so with the foreknowledge of who he would save and did so with the foreknowledge that even before time began, I would move time in history to save them. He did that. And then he turned around and gave you that power. Does that make you feel a little uncomfortable? Not in maybe an awkward sense, but in a, oh my goodness. <laughs> like, I have that. I have God's power. Well, be at peace. Be at peace because peace is yours from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what peace is. It's the idea of shalom, it's everything perfect. Every, everything lined up just as it should be. That God gave you his peace. He, he aligned a relationship that was way off. He, through his son, reconciled you to your father and put that just so. And then he didn't make a mistake 
putting this in place. You, holding his power and his authority. Do you feel like maybe that's too heavy? Like, like it's too much. Like, who am I to hold that? Be at peace. Peace to you from God the Father and Christ Jesus. Do you admit that there's times you messed up that whole power and authority thing? You, you maybe used it for wrong reasons. Peace to you. Peace to you from God and from Christ Jesus. Think about this line. God does not lie. It's interesting. It's, Paul just kind of inserts it. Let me tell you a thing, thing about God. He carried out salvation. He called me to be an apostle. Oh, by the way, he doesn't lie. Think about that as it relates to the authority that God has given you. You believe God, right? You believe that he promised to send his son and did so. You, you believe that his son said he would give up his life and take it up again and did so. You believe Jesus when he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'm going to come back and take you to be with me. He's doing so. You believe him, right? That he's with you always, even now, and he is. Do we not also believe this? This gospel truth that God gives to ordinary people his extraordinary power. So let me ask you this now. We've kind of answered the question, right? You know that God gives you authority. As you look at that gospel truth, what's the dominating sensation or, or feeling that you live with? Is it one of a quiet and humble confidence living out of that? Or are you kind of timid? A little sheepish? A little embarrassed to let people know? Friends, the spirit God gave us, it's clear, doesn't make us timid, but it is of one of power, love, and self-discipline. Is it true that you abdicate your possessing of, of extraordinary authority simply because it's a little tough? It's kind of hard. It means you're going to have to live a little bit courageously. I don't know. Maybe it's because we grew up hearing that, that power is bad, authority corrupts. Maybe we've bought into that lie ourselves. But the truth is that, that power and authority, these aren't bad. I mean, used poorly, they're bad, but power and authority are, are good gifts given to you by your good and gracious God. Perhaps the problem is that we don't know how to use them. That brings us to our second question today. You have it. You know it. It's a gift of God's grace. Do, do you know how to use it? Let's zoom out for just a second, shall we? We're looking primarily at Titus chapter 1. S see what's going on here, okay? Jesus, the Lord of the church, gives his power and authority. Let's pick one apostle, Paul. Paul then looks to Titus, young pastor Titus, and says, I'm giving you, I'm instructing you about the authority that God gives to all believers, and here's what I want you to do. I'm leaving you to put things in order, to put in charge other people to use God's power and authority. Now, it might seem to you that this is just kind of a boring uh, church organizational chapter of the Bible, or may maybe it's just kind of some not so exciting nuts and bolts of, of church planting. But step back and see again what Paul is doing here. He's telling us, he's teaching us how to use power and authority. Paul gives us a pretty clear purpose statement for how God wants us to use it in verse 2 
of Titus chapter one. Here's what he said. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God who does not lie promised before the beginning of time. The question we're asking is this, do you know how to use God's power and authority? It's this, it's, it's several parts. It's to further the faith. It's to increase the knowledge that God's people have about his truth. And not just kind of in some cold intellectual way, but to do so in a way that leads to godly living. All in the view of what? A gift. A gift that Christ won for you. The hope of eternal life. Let's remember it a little bit more concisely. Do you know how to use the power and authority God's given you? It's for the eternal good of others. That's what it's for. If you use the extraordinary power and authority that God has given you to make a name for yourself, that's an abuse. If you use the extraordinary power and authority that God has given you to coerce, manipulate, control, or dominate people, that's an abuse. If you use the extraordinary power and authority that God has given you to make your life comfortable, a little more fun. That's an abuse because God has given it for one reason. It's for others and it's for their eternal good. We said it before, but it is worth repeating that power and authority are not bad. Used poorly, they're bad, but well, used appropriately to God's glory and for others, these things are good. In fact, they're necessary. I mean, think about it. How else is the power and authority of the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh beaten back if it's not for the power and the authority that, that God has? There's a story that takes place in Mark chapter 10. It, it takes place just four chapters after Mark chapter six. And in that chapter, a couple of disciples get a little, well, obsessed with the idea of authority. They're not thinking about it right. James and John, they, they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, thank you for giving us that power and authority back in Mark chapter six. Hey, when you come into your kingdom, what do you think? My brother on your left, me on the right? As you can imagine, the other 10 apostles are none too pleased. And so Jesus gathers them around it and he says this to them. He says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you, you're different. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be a servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Do you know how to use the authority that God has given you? It's never to be exercised over people but it is always for people. It is always for their eternal good. I mean, think about this. This is interesting. Jesus doesn't say, actually, I'm taking the authority back. Jesus doesn't try to get them to uh, divest your authority. You're not really worthy of it. No, he says, you have it. It's true, you do have it, but you're thinking about it differently. You're thinking about it like the world does. You must think about it the way I do. Here's how I use my power and authority. Jesus says, I came to give up my life for others so that they might have life eternal. That's you. You do the same. We answered the questions. You know you have it. You know how to use it. But there's one issue that we might be wrestling with still. You might be thinking to yourself, I, I'm not in a position of authority. I don't have really a powerful 
personality. So what do we do? We need to think about how we actually use in, in meaningful ministry this power and authority. What I want to do as we close today is give you three very applicable ways that this power can be used for the good of others, for the eternal good of others. What, what tools maybe do you have at your disposal to use? Here's the first. Your servant heart has power. It has power and authority for the eternal good of others. Think about this. Jesus said in Mark that it's, it's not to be with you, that you exercise it over, but you must be a servant of all. You must be a slave of all. Paul refers to himself as a servant of God. As we think about authority and we think about it in terms of power dynamics, it's really easy to think about it the way the world does. There's a mistake to think that we have to have a position, a high position in order to have power. The f first mistake is that. The second is that we think, you know what, people serving, they clearly don't have power. But Jesus reframes that entirely. He flips it on its head. He says, if you're going to serve at all, you have to have power. You have to have the ability and the authority to carry out this service. And he gives it. He gives it first and foremost by pointing people to him and how he used his power and authority as the savior of the world. He did it as a servant of all. Your attitude, your heart, your servant's heart has the ability to influence others, to influence them not in a small way, but in an eternally grand way. Your attitude does, but so also, you saw it, so do your words. Your words have the power, have the authority to create eternal life. Just like the apostle, excuse me, prophet Amos, you've been called to go and prophesy. And prophesy doesn't mean like seeing into the future, although prophets did that. It means in the wide sense, it means proclaiming, thus says the Lord, this is what God says. You have the ability, the authority to speak divine realities because God said, go. Teach him what I, what I said. You have the ability, the power, and the authority to encourage. Perhaps most of all, this is a wonderful way to exercise your authority. To look at someone who's sitting in guilt or sadness, or frustrated with life, and speak words of encouragement. To also look at someone who's, who's speaking wrong ideas and say, wait, no, this is what God's word says. To refute those, you have the power to speak divine realities, encouragement, to speak words that refute error, but also you have the ability to change, to bring about change in people's lives by, by saying, repent, repent. And also God forgives all your sins. You have the ability to speak words, words from scripture that maybe don't drive out demons per se, but do fight temptations that come from the devil. You have the ability to heal and maybe not in a physical way, but to heal spiritual harm with the very words you speak. Here's the last one. Your behavior has power. We're going to read a section from Titus right now, a section from Titus that, well, it illustrates qualifications or lays out qualifications for overseers, deacons, pastors, leaders in the church. And while these words are meant for overseers and elders, Ask yourself this, is this not true for all Christians? Here's what Titus says, that an elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a one-woman man. His children are not to live debaucherously wild lives. Also, an overseer must be not overbearing, not someone who says, here, I'm here to, you serve me, but who serves others. Not quick-tempered, doesn't stir up conflict, not given to drunkenness, not violent in either their words or their actions, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be 
hospitable, someone who, who loves strangers, one who loves what is good, one who is self-controlled, avoids extremes, high or low, this way or that, and someone who is upright, holy, and disciplined. There, there's two takeaways from this list. Here's the first one. Is it not true that this is for all Christians who go about meaningful ministry? After all, think about it. Your behavior, the way you act, it, it doesn't have the power to convert people's hearts, does it? But might it be a stumbling block? If a Christian pastor is out there with words that are constantly stirring up conflict, that's not good. If a Christian is, person is out there and constantly getting wasted, just, just one of the guys, is that helpful for the Christian witness? If a Christian pastor is not following what God's word says about family, it's not helpful for the witness. If a Christian person is constantly using their words to, to let it be known that service is such a bane, instead of that I serve willingly and joyfully, how does that affect the Christian witness? Undoubtedly, it does. Your behavior has power. Here's a second, here's a second takeaway from these verses. Was it just me or do these words sit heavy as you hear them? As you read through this list, as I read through this list, as someone who is called to, to be a pastor, an overseer, Undoubtedly, it sits heavy. Because here's the truth, I'm not blameless. I have blame. And perhaps you do too. So here's the thought, does that make you and me a liability in ministry? Someone who, who can't participate in ministry? Or does our honesty, our, our vulnerability about that make us an asset? Someone who was once tasked with assessing pastors for the call of ministry would ask a question about them. He, he would say, are you a wounded healer or are you a healing wounder? You get that? A healing wounder. Let's start at the end. A healing wounder is somebody who's been wounded, wounded by sin, their own or another's, and they're in the process of healing. And, and so in the process of healing, they, they actually wound others. When given power and authority, they, they don't use it for others. They use it as a shield for themselves and their ego. They use it for their own good instead of well, good of others. A healing wounder is somebody who looks at the qualifications for ministry and, and ignores them and, and tries to cast off what God's actually asking there. How's that different from a wounded healer? A wounded healer is somebody who has heard the message that God gives in his word. The message that Jesus' apostles went out with and said, repent. And says, yeah. I got to do that. There's a list of things here that I need to repent of, but it's also someone who, is, who has been healed, knowing that God proclaims a message of forgiveness. And what is it that makes you blameless? Well, it's not your, it's not your good behavior. What makes you blameless is, well, is, is Christ. Christ, Ephesians 5, who loved the church and gave himself up for the church, for you, for me. Why? to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, to present her to himself, to present you to him as one who has listened without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. You are blameless because of the son. And that makes you a wounded healer. Vulnerably speaking, we have wounds 
from our own sins, from sins of others. But speaking that to others brings about healing. So let's ask this question. We've, we've answered two. Are you someone who can be trusted with power and authority? Friends, you know the answer is yes, because you have been given God's extraordinary authority and you've been given it for a purpose that is outside of you. It's for the eternal good of others. May God bless you as you exercise it for his sake and to his glory. Amen.